Well, hello friends in ADHD. It's Russ Barkley back again with another short commentary related to ADHD. In this case, I want to talk about a second attention disorder called cognitive disengagement syndrome. So let's tee up our PowerPoint. You'll find much longer lectures and details about this syndrome on this channel under the playlist for the other attention disorder. It used to be called sluggish cognitive tempo, but it was renamed in 2022 as cognitive disengagement syndrome. Now, mind you, this is not an official diagnosis, but it is a condition that is being increasingly studied by researchers in the field of ADHD because it had been previously misdiagnosed as ADHD or thought to be a subtype of ADHD, and at one point was being called ADD because it lacked the problems with impulsivity, hyperactivity, and even distractibility, but also was characterized by attention problems. So I'm going to call it the other attention disorder in contrast to ADHD, but just know that it goes by the moniker now of CDS. Now, CDS is a psychological condition that is comprised of two dimensions of symptoms that are highly correlated with each other but are distinct from ADHD and from other types of psychopathology as well. The first dimension is characterized by symptoms of cognitive or mental confusion, often seen in staring, daydreaming, a spacey-like appearance, increased drowsiness, mental fogginess, and in general, a withdrawal of attention from ongoing external exogenous events. The individual appears to be mentally or cognitively disengaged or preoccupied, hence the name of the syndrome now, cognitive disengagement syndrome. The second dimension is the dimension of low motor activity, usually characterized by hypoactivity at certain times, not continuously, slow motor responding, some degree of passivity in response to the environment, social withdrawal, and a general appearance of lethargy. It was thought to also involve a sluggish reactivity to external events. Now, it's believed that these motor symptoms arise as a result of, to some extent, the cognitive symptoms. When you disengage from the environment and you are preoccupied with mental content, you likely are going to act or behave in a much more reduced fashion toward the environment than other people. Now, as, I, as I've said, this was called cognitive disengagement syndrome in 2022. Prior to that, for the earlier nearly 40 years of research on it, it was called sluggish cognitive tempo, or SCT. If you want to see more on that research, go ahead and use Google Scholar and put in that search term and you'll come up with a lot of studies. If you use the CDS search term, of course, you're only going to come up with the most recent ones that have shifted over to using this new name. And by the way, the reason for the new name is that the old name was pretty offensive. It was rather derogatory, kind of implied a, a, a sort of stupidity or low IQ or some degree of cognitive intellectual problems, which was, of course, not meant to be the case. It also implied a kind of cognitive characterization that involves slow motor processing and movement. Well, it turned out in research that that wasn't found to be the case, particularly for anyone older than the preschool age group. So the name itself was misleading, and that's why it was misnamed. So two dimensions, one cognitive involving mental disengagement, staring, daydreaming, and to some extent confusion. The second involving periodic episodes of low motor activity, slow responding, and so on. Now, here are the most common symptoms identified in research for CDS what was called SCT at the time this particular review and study was done. And you can see here why we characterize SCT or CDS 
into two dimensions. You'll see behavior is slow, lost in a fog, stares blankly, drowsy, sleepy, daydreamy, and so on down the list. I'm not going to read all of these to you. You can read them for yourself. Notice that the ones that I have in yellow turn out to be characteristic of CDS, but equally as likely to be seen in ADHD. So they're not very discriminating symptoms, even though we see them a lot, but we see them in both disorders. So they need to be removed from a symptom list because they're not specifically differentially seen in CDS. So there are about 12 symptoms here that are really good at identifying SCT. And by the way, out of that 12, if you happen to have four or five of them that occur often or more frequently for at least six months and lead to impairment in major life activities, those would be sort of diagnostic criteria we might use in research, which I have, to identify people with SCT. So there's your symptom list. Now, what is going on in the head? when we talk to or evaluate people with CDS. What is its cognitive nature? Well, it appears to be a mixed bag of mental states, all of which involve disengaging from processing the environment as much as other people are doing and being preoccupied with mental content. One possibility also occurs a lot in CDS is maladaptive daydreaming, this excessive propensity to engage in these elaborate fantasies and fictional stories and renderings, often involving previous experiences and usually involving some kind of personal aggrandizement, like a superhero or something solving all the problems. It can also involve, to some extent, dissociative episodes, but in general, it's maladaptive daydreaming. The second mental state that may be going on here is brooding or rumination, the kind of mental regurgitation that we might see in people with depression or anxiety, where they are mentally preoccupied with their problems and they engage in repetitive mental preoccupation, usually over situations that had negative outcomes for them. So there's a bit of self-absorption about this kind of <clears throat> mental status or mind wandering. The third possibility, also seen in CDS, is spontaneous mind wandering. This is kind of what you do when you're sitting in the doctor's office, don't have anything to do, you're waiting for your appointment, and your mind kind of skips across different ideas that freely come to mind while you're sitting there. So it's kind of an excessive shifting or skipping across ideas of various mental content usually involving routine tasks. It's kind of an internal distractibility. It's not well organized. It's not goal directed. It's not daydreaming in the sense that there's a fantasy and it's not brooding in the sense that one is ruminating over past problems. It's just kind of mind wandering, skipping around over things. Lastly is mind blanking in which the individual is staring, but there's no real mental activity going on. If you will, lights on, but nobody's home. This may be akin to very focal waking state sleep activity, and it has been associated with patterns on the EEG that suggest that certain focal areas of the brain have gone to sleep. The individual isn't sleeping, and it's not narcolepsy. There hasn't been a complete collapse in the individual's consciousness in which they're sleeping, but it does look like certain areas of the brain might have gone to sleep, leaving the person kind of staring. Much like you might see in a form of seizures called absent spells, but in this case it tends to be somewhat voluntary and the individual can be pulled out of it pretty quickly by calling attention to them or calling their name. That's not true of those focal epileptic seizures that I just mentioned. So four possible mind states going on to varying degrees across people with CDS. It's not clear which of these is the most predominant, though spontaneous mind wandering certainly is one that qualifies for that. But it's likely that we see elements of all four 
across people characterized as CDS. Now, <clears throat> is CDS distinct from ADHD and other disorders? It appears to be that it is. And if we go through the major criteria for identifying a new mental disorder in the context of other mental disorders, they have to meet these criteria. Number one, are the symptoms coherent? Are they highly correlated with each other and a lot less correlated with other symptoms of other psychopathologies? The answer to that is yes. Is there a difference in comorbidity? Does the pattern of linkage to other mental disorders appear to be different than it is, say, for ADHD, the disorder that comes closest to CDS? And the answer is yes. There is a high rate of oppositional disorder, conduct disorder, alcohol use, drug use, substance use, antisocial activity, uh, and even, to a lesser extent, anxiety that's seen in ADHD, whereas in CDS, there's a much higher rate of depression and anxiety and almost no elevation in the risk for oppositional or conduct disorder or any of those other antisocial or substance use disorders. So a very distinct pattern of comorbidity. What about demographic correlates? Are they different? Yes. The differences here appear to be in ADHD, a higher rate of boys more than girls, three to one, by adolescents, that falls to two to one. By adulthood, that falls to one and a half to one, but still somewhat a predominance of males over females. That's not true of CDS, where the rate of disorder appears to be equal across the sexes. It's also characteristic of all ethnic groups that have been studied so far in national surveys. So uh, it appears then that there's a different demographic pattern to CDS. What about age-related declines. We see declines in symptoms of ADHD. We do not see that in CDS. It appears to be a very stable attention disorder across the lifespan, as far as we can tell from national surveys. Does it have different cognitive correlates? Apparently so. There is little, if any, evidence of disinhibition or impulsivity in CDS. Indeed, some studies suggest that the likelihood of impulsivity is even lower than we see in the typical population. On the other hand, there is an increase in this kind of disengagement from the environment, making a lot more errors in processing information about the environment because of this disengagement. And as I've said, probably an increase in mind wandering and maladaptive daydreaming. What about impairments in major life activities? Both ADHD and CDS are highly impairing, but ADHD is much more impairing across most areas of life compared to CDS, which appears to be more focally impairing in school and social activities in childhood. But by adulthood, adults with CDS report even more severe impairment in educational settings and work settings than even adults with ADHD do. That was quite a surprise. So a distinct pattern of impairments across major life activities. As I've said, the developmental courses for the two appear to be different. We need more research on that. There are very few longitudinal studies of CDS. They mainly involve following children for 10 years into adolescence or for even a shorter period of time, but they show a very stable pattern of symptoms across this time period. And our cross-sectional studies of the U.S. showed that CDS had the same prevalence, about 5%, from the preschool years all the way up into the 80s in individuals. Now that's in the U.S., suggesting that it's a pretty stable disorder over time. What about etiologies? Well, we know a lot about the etiology of ADHD, primarily genetic, but it can also involve acquired injuries to the brain and other factors. We see a similar pattern in CDS, not quite as genetically inherited as ADHD, but close. The few twin studies that have been done suggest a heritability of about 0.6 for CDS, where it's around 0.7 to 0.8 for ADHD. What does that mean? That means that about 60% of the variation in symptoms in the population seems to be related to genetic factors. So little less heritable than ADHD. 
There have been other studies suggesting that CDS is seen more in children who have survived leukemia and been treated for it, that it may occur more in children with autism spectrum disorder, that it may occur more in children who had fetal alcohol syndrome or exposure. So there appear to be high rates of CDS in some acquired disorders or medical conditions than we would see in ADHD. But we still got to do a lot more research on etiology. Family history hasn't been studied very much in CDS, so I'm not going to talk about that. And are there biological correlates, distinctions between the two? Well, there's been a lot of research on ADHD and biological correlates, very little on CDS. But what little has been done suggests that whereas ADHD primarily involves the frontal lobes and their connections back into the brain, known as the executive functioning networks, CDS, on the other hand, appears to involve the posterior part of the brain, known as the default mode network. But again, you need a lot more research on those correlates and etiologies before we're going to know for sure. What about treatment response? Very little research done here, but it does seem that the stimulants, specifically methylphenidate, has been studied and not very helpful for CDS. Indeed, one study found that the more symptoms of CDS someone had, the less likely they would show a positive response to methylphenidate. Other drugs have been looked at, but mainly in adults who had both ADHD and CDS. Those studies suggested that the amphetamines, such as Vyvanse, were helpful in managing some of the symptoms of CDS. But again, keep in mind, these are people who also had ADHD, so that could explain that. There's been no study of amphetamines that I know of with people who had exclusively CDS. Finally, there was one study in children that suggested that atomoxetine, also called Stratera, did show some preferential benefits to improving CDS in children who, again, had both ADHD and CDS. So we need a lot more studies on treatments for people with CDS exclusively. So there you have it. That's my quick overview of CDS, the other attention disorder. I hope you found this informative. You can look at the much longer hour and a half lecture on CDS under that playlist on my YouTube channel if you're interested in the deep dive into this content. Also, the description that accompanies that video or those series of videos, that description contains a research review of CDS up through 2022. And you can read the entire review as it's publicly available. So you can take a look there if you want to read that review. Okay, everybody, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate you subscribing to this channel. Please do so if you haven't. I also really appreciate you recommending this channel to others who might have an interest in ADHD. So I'll see you back later this week with more videos on ADHD. Thanks for joining me, everyone, and be well.